Hey, hey, everyone. This time back to talk about Roland Barthes' The Death of the Author, so this will probably be pretty quick because it's only about five or six pages. Uh, before jumping into that, I want to give a shout out to all my patrons who have been extremely helpful. There's Boz, James, John, Matt, Nicholas, and Sebastian who have all been very, very helpful. Uh, and for anyone else willing to contribute, that would be great. Obviously, in these times, take care of yourself first. Uh, but for those that want this in podcast form, you can find this on Podbean or Apple or wherever. Uh, and you can find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy. And that's about it. Of course, take care of yourself in these crazy times. Uh, and for now, let's just jump into it. So Balt starts this off by talking about Balzac's uh, text Saracene, where Balzac describes a uh, castrato disguised as a woman and in um in the text we find this quote this was woman herself with her sudden fears her irrational whims her instinctive worries her impetuous boldness her fussings and her delicious sensibility now that's in balzac so balt thinks about this moment and asks who is the subject of this speaking statement like who is it um kind of pointing this out and of course, for those familiar with the text, it's not really ever revealed who is speaking, right? There's just a kind of unnamed, almost narrator. So he says, then, is this Balzac influenced by his own experience with women? Is it a hero of the story, ignorant of the fact that the person is in disguise? Or is it simply universal wisdom, in Balzac's words? So to these questions, he says that we can't necessarily have an answer because, in his words, writing is the destruction of every voice, of every point of origin, which is an interesting claim. And he'll come to show, through this short text, why he thinks that to be the case. That is, how writing destroys origins. So for Balt, as a text becomes its own kind of subject, it becomes its own identity, our subjectivity slips away. That is, the subjectivity of the reader, and the subjectivity of the author, thing that will be explained in more detail later on. Now, this is for Balt, a kind of truth of all writing. That is, this happens at any point, in his words, a fact is narrativized or is narrated without a view to acting directly on reality, but only acting instead in transit, sorry, intransitively. So an intransitive verb is like a verb that uh, doesn't have a direct object. Like, um, um, he fell down suddenly, where falling down, the, the verb, uh, is not followed by the thing falling down, like the body, it, as opposed to a transitive verb where it's like, um, I enjoy uh, marshmallows, where marshmallows are, you know, the thing being enjoyed. But that's not totally important. So about this, there is something to be said about um, something new happening. So while this is kind of a truth of all writing, Balt is also concerned with the emergence of something else coming concomitantly to this idea of the author. Now, this idea of the author emerges alongside the idea more generally of the individual or the human person in his words. So that, you know, kind of coming after the Middle Ages, which is a thing that anyone kind of versed in French uh, philosophy in the mid to 20th century, you know, this question of the emergence of the subject is very much a germane. It's very relevant. Now, he opposes that to a kind of oral tradition where the person speaking took on less the role of a kind of author and more the role of a performer. So there was in that they took on like this kind of uh, double identity that was for about pretty interesting but you know he's like we've moved beyond that so now we're concerned with this author figure that kind of takes on this status of a, of a kind of godlike figure in that they are seen as being the truth of a text and that is wrapped up with our idea of what subjects are what individuals are that is a very neoliberal idea of course before that is avant la lettre before we had that idea of neoliberalism now to just kind of prove that I'm not just uh, throwing in these anachronistic terms. In his words, 
Um, the idea that the author is indelibly linked to the text uh, is for him, or for him it relates to positivism. What he says in his words, the epitome of the culmination of capitalist ideology. So he just kind of throws that in here, but he doesn't really expand upon it. But it has a lot to do with it in that there is certainly an obsession with a kind of truth, you know, within this system. That is a truth that is always reducible to individuals, where any problem is an individual problem. Any um, truth is an individual truth. Now, Balth isn't deluded. He, he's very aware that there have been t attempts by so many different playwrights and authors before him, like Proust, uh, Proust uh, Valéry, Mallarmé, Mallarmé, who were able to, in his mind, kind of trouble the idea of the author in that they were always trying to move beyond what the author would allow, to move into the space of language that was a lot more dynamic, a lot more fluid. And perhaps a little bit more broadly, he gives attention to surrealism, which was, in his words, uh, or it renounces the author by ceaselessly recommending the abrupt disappointment of expectations of meaning by entrusting the hand with the task of writing as quickly as possible what the head was not aware of. So the hand would kind of get away from the head. So then if that ever happened, it would be impossible for us to say or try to look at for the intent, the intent behind the piece of writing, behind the text. Now, I, ha I have to acknowledge that there are fields of thought, take psychoanalysis as being one in some, in some cases, that is obviously dissatisfied with what Balth is saying here, because psychoanalysis would see in all words a kind of possible foray that is a possible entry point into the psyche, almost the truth, I will say, you know, kind of in quotes, of the, the subject writing it. So just to put that out there, Balt doesn't talk about that, but it's just an important detail that I thought was necessary. Now, he says that we kind of learn from linguistics, and certainly semiotics, that the act of speaking and language itself, that is the thing that is believed to be enunciated through the act of speaking, takes on its own life. So for him, the I, that is the I that, uh, when, when I say I am, that's the I he's talking about here. He says the I is nothing other than the instance of saying I. Language knows a subject, and this subject is empty outside of the very enunciation which defines it. So we only attain our status as subjects by having this kind of relationship to language. And because we now know that language is this thing that, you know, is fluid and arbitrary and dynamic, it, 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 it is a very tenuous thing to assume that we have a, a, a kind of firm hold of ourselves. Instead, this self is always, you know, being uh, altered, changed, just like language. Now, despite this, in terms of our interpretation, we are so obsessed with kind of tracing uh, or, or finding the lineage from the text to the author where, you know, the truth of the text is in the author or, you, you know, it becomes a matter of trying to decipher the truth of the text where we see the author and the book standing automatically, in his words, on a single line divided by before and after. Now, this kind of godlike paradigm, that, that the one that kind of attributes the act of creation with the author and the author alone, uh, Balt co contrasts that with the idea of the scripter. Now, the scripter is the writer who writes purely from the hand. Uh, that is a hand that is completely, in his words, cut off from any voice, born by a pure gesture of inscription. That is, it is completely removed, not only from the voice, but from the head. And by virtue of this, the scripter works almost alongside language, to call into question all origins. And we know that this is true, because in his words, there is no author God that is producing a line of words releasing a single theological meaning. Like, that does not exist, because if that were true, then every person to whom that those words were addressed would come out of it with the exact same understanding. And that never happens, ever. So instead, he says that writing is uh, a multi-dimensional space where words and language blend and clash. 
And because the author is not this kind of godlike figure, as we may have once assumed, and still in many cases assume, they therefore never produce anything original. They only draw from the innumerable centers of culture. And the book then is only a tissue of signs, in his words. So there's nothing that's purely original in that everything already comes from a kind of collective understanding of culture, of, you know, the society, of even even when it comes down to language itself, the very codes that are embedded within a specific language that vary greatly determine in very many ways what people are able to say. And he says that it's it's almost like a there's almost like a big conspiracy where the critic took it upon themselves to be the person that that tried to find the truth of the text, right? They were the ones that were going to decipher the text. And so Balth is almost like, uh, well, maybe the author was created for the critic. The critic created the author so that they could claim to, you know, be finding the truth of the text. But that's, you know, kind of an aside. So does that mean we can't engage with the text? That Does that mean we can't uh, kind of ponder a text to contemplate a text? He says, absolutely not. He says, of course, do that. Think about texts, consider them, you know, argue about them. But he says that it should be considered instead of a deciphering, more a disentanglement. And with that is opened up a kind of revolutionary potential because he calls this an anti-theological act. That is, it's, a, it's, a, it's an act moving us away from this kind of ultimate truth that can be unearthed with like enough, I don't know, theoretical rigor. And instead, we are left with endless possible interpretation that, you know, allows for different voices to be heard. And what will come with that is the kind of dissipation of God and his uh, hypostases, in his words here, reason, science, and law. So in this way, because now we know that the the piece of writing is kind of multidimensional, it's multiplicitous, that is, it's taking from culture, it's taking from language, it's, it's taking from society, taking from religion, it's taking from the past, history, you know, it's coming from all these different places. The only time that it actually kind of galvanizes into a single point is with the reader, because the reader is its destination, right? Not where it comes from, because we already know that where it comes from is a very um, un uh, unstable place. But we have to be really careful with this, and I think a lot of people get this wrong. The very last line of this text goes as follows. The birth of the reader must be at the cost of the death of the author. Now, I'm sure you all heard that, or, you know, if you look, if you've had to look this up in the past, you came across this uh, passage. But that's not the whole quote. He says that that is, in fact, the myth. So what does that mean, that that's the myth? He cautions that if we get rid of this thing called the author, and, you know, even me saying it like that, I'm, I'm, I'm attributing too much intent behind it. When in fact, this is like a broad, you know, cultural and epist epistemic change. But let's just say that this author disappears. He says it would be wrong then to inscribe the reader with a kind of, you know, neutral status. You know, this kind of neutral interpreter of the text. So it's in that way that we must be very careful in how we understand this text is not necessarily being about the birth of the reader, because for him, that'd be totally wrong. In his words, in fact, he wants us to understand the reader as being faceless. We're here, actually, in his words, he says, without history, without biography, without psychology, the reader is simply someone who holds together in a single field all the traces by which the written text is constituted. So the reader is not this kind of superior thing to the author. In fact, they are both quite fragile things. But, um... Yeah, so be careful with that. But that's about it. Uh, I guess I'll read the last line here now that I've kind of contextualized my own interpretation of it. We now, or we know that to give writing its future, it is necessary to overthrow the myth. That is the myth that the birth of the reader must be at the cost of the death of the author. Both of these things are very fragile. Neither the author nor the reader can really be said to exist, but they do hold some kind of like cultural ground. But it is important for us to recognize that this ground is very unstable. And that is precisely what opens up possibility, opens up interpretation. 
But yeah, that's about it, I guess. If you enjoyed what I did here, uh, you know how to leave a comment, or if I did something wrong, you definitely know how to leave a comment and make me feel dumb. That's not the great, greatest word. You know how to make me feel goofy. Um, but yeah, so catch you next time.